in 300 meters take a left at the valley. Now on CIDL 101.7 FM. Hi, this is Bill Edgerwood with Imagine No Religion 6, and I took a left at the valley, and you should too. I woke up this morning, had a burning deep inside, like when you're feeling, it's all a big lie. I feel the pain. Welcome back to another edition of Left of the Valley, and while I'm watching Sarah dancing on her chair, thank you to all for listening. Hi guys, how you doing? Good, how about yourself? Are you? Good, good. This is a show about uh, positive atheism, skeptical thinking, and secular humanism, and today we got a great show for you guys. Anybody wants to say anything about their past week or so? No, I'm going to save mine for the history. I really doubt you guys all have a a life as boring (laughs) as mine. There's got to be somebody with some interesting news. Oh, I do. I went and saw the movie Witch last night. Okay. Um, It's supposed to be quite a horror movie, huh? It's... Well, some people walked out. It's not bad, but you know what? If you're looking, <laughs> if you're if you're looking for some really intense horror, don't go and see it. If you want a cult movie that's gonna be around for like 20, 30 years, yeah, then it's good. But I liked it historically. I thought it was awesome. But yeah, it yeah. was it was not bad. I just went to see Deadpool instead. I think I, I got a better bang for my buck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, today we're gonna have a show about health supplements, and that should be very interesting. Um, our fr- dear friend Martina has, uh, has done a lot of bit of research, and this is going to be an interesting uh, topic because I myself do take health supplements, so I'm very interested in hearing what Martina has to say. But in the meantime, Nancy, you ready to go? I'm up. I'm ready. All righty. We're ready for this day in history, which is a roundup of those events and individuals that altered and illuminated the days between... February the 8th to February the 21st. Starting with February the 8th, it was Chinese New Year. February the 9th was Extraterrestrial Visitor's Day, Pizza Day, and Read in the Bathtub Day. You know, that kind of goes together for some reason. I know. I think that's a great date when you can combine all of those celebrations into one and enjoy it with the bubble bath bubbles. What's better? (laughs) What could be better? (laughs) Anyway, going to February the 9th, this is going to this is going to take a little bit of time, but it's fascinating. Uh, in 2005, that was the year that the Danish newspapers published the cartoons with Muhammad. Yes. At, which sparked worldwide dissension um, and some uprisings, and it was a it was a pretty difficult time for the press because they didn't know whether or not to publish the cartoons or not publish the cartoons. So that was a an interesting discussion that most of the newspapers had about freedom of the press and uh, the, the, where journalism should go when faced with these kinds of hot topics. And, and, so let, and let's face it, most car, most uh, journalists actually decided to opt out and take the coward's way out and not show those cartoons. That's right. Let's Moving to the Canadian press, with the exception of certain uh, university newspapers, uh, Montreal, Calgary, the Western Standard, and the Jewish Free Press chose not to reprint the cartoons. But one university decided to go full bore, and that was the University of Prince Edward Island, and that was the newspaper called The Cadre. Now, The Cadre is not uh, without controversy because the year before, they did an article on the front page about Christmas called Christ effing Christmas, but they didn't—they—they <laughs> they didn't use the effing. Everybody can can fill that in. So they—they they were used to controversy, and so when this came up, they decided, what the heck? They're going to go full bore, and they published all of the cartoons in the paper. Well, immediately after they did that, the student union called the editor in to his office or her office and said, you're not going to publish these because whether you're aware of it or not, the student union is in charge of the paper. You're not autonomous. And so they demanded that the cadre return 2,000 copies they had already printed. 
So there was a little bit of dissension with the paper, but the cadre in the end caved and they collected back the 2,000 uh, papers. They were also threatened to be removed from campus unless they did. So they had a practical consideration of do we, do we fight this, do we have a lawsuit, do we return them, what do we do? So uh, they, they decided in the end to return the 2,000 copies. Um, they uh, reestablished themselves as the newspaper on campus until 2014 when they gave up publica uh, print publication altogether and went totally online. But that brought up um, a, a lot of controversy as to whether or not they had the right to do it since they were owned by the student union. Was it free press that the student union was suppressing? So uh, I, I, we, we really need to follow through with some of these questions perhaps on, a, on another show because I think they're, they're fascinating ones and it would be great if we could get a journalist in to weigh in. So hopefully that'll be a, a topic for another show. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. February the 12th was Darwin Day, so a belated happy birthday, sir. And you would be proud to know wherever you are that many of us are dedicated to ensure the fact that evolution is still alive and well in science classes all over North America. Hooray for Darwin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a brief mention of February the 13th which was World Radio Day, believe it or not. Look at that. Yeah, so we can celebrate uh, World Radio Day. And I don't know whether you remember, Kevin, but it was just about this time last year that we did our CIVL demo. Yes. Yeah, so we are part of the celebration of, of uh, World Radio Day. And we are here recording in their studios. Which Absolutely. Is, you know, fantastic. And it is. Much better equipment than my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, up to Valentine's Day, and we had our Valentine's Day last uh, our last show, which was great. So I wanted to find something else that um, was going on on Valentine's Day other than Valentine's Day. So I did find that the week of Valentine's Day is a celebration that started at Yale University in the States, and that's Sex Week. <laughs> so, awesome. that's, uh, well, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of what you're thinking, wipe that out for a minute. <laughs> I know. Save it. Save it till later. Um, Sex Week was organized in 2002, and it started at Yale. And it's a biennial event proclaimed on its website as Deep Breath, an inter disciplinary sex education program designed to pique students' interest through creative, interactive, and exciting programming. They don't go into what the exciting programming is, but I have a feeling it's probably academic. And anyway, Sex oh. Week at Yale um, uh, has um, spread. Uh, I don't know whether you say a sex education <laughs> program has spread, but it has. <laughs> <laughs> To the University, University of Calgary, PEI, and the West Indies. So there are about 12 schools that do a sex week, um, and it is all academic. And I, I don't know whether it has to do uh, as well with, uh, with, with date rape on campus, but it would be good if that was a topic that they, that they covered as well. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Um, in 1987, on uh, February the 14th, it was the start of the Raging Grannies. Anybody know about the Raging yes. Grannies? Yes. You all know about the Raging Grannies? There's oh. actually a group in uh, Maple Ridge. There, there is a group in, in Maple Ridge. Well, they started, they're great. They're absolutely great. And there's activist organizations all over the place. But they started in Victoria um, back in 1987. Uh, and it was over the winter of 1986-87. And they originally called themselves NERT, or NERT, for Nuclear Emergency Response Team. And, and the members believed that the presence of U.S. Navy nuclear power ships in Victoria Harbor posed potential health and environmental risks to the city. So the way they rage is by, by writing songs that are politically charged, 
they use um, melodies that everybody already knows so that everybody can sing along and they dress in wild outfits that are supposed to mock the stereotype of, of granny so a lot of them have boas they have funny hats they have uh, funny shoes long stockings but the fun the, the, the fun starts in satire uh, the minute they start they start to sing so if any of you ever heard any of the raging yeah, well, I couldn't name it off the top of my head. That's true. Yeah, well, one of the one of the chapters is in in Florida, and uh, last year in the Florida Senate, one of the Florida senators was on the floor of the Senate, and he said that his wife should incorporate her uterus to stop the Republicans from abortion legislation. And the reason he wanted to incorporate that is he said the, the, the Republicans don't like to interfere with business. And so, <laughs> so the uterus, her uterus would now be incorporated as a business. Well, for some reason that I can't comprehend, the Republicans just didn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> and so, <laughs> about the whole thing, uh, hard, hard to believe. And the the uh, senator, who's Senator Scott, they said will refrain from uh, using words about any body parts in the Senate. So that was a dirty word in the Senate. He couldn't say uterus, and they couldn't use any other any body parts. So the raging grannies took that as an opportunity to write a song. <laughs> And they wrote, wrote a, a wonderful song called The Uterus Song. And I won't sing it because I've just, <laughs> I respect all of you too much. I'll, I will read the first, the, the, the first verse. And it's, it's done to bye bye Blackbird, but I, I'll say it. <laughs> if you're a Republican, it's okay to screw everyone. Just don't say uterus. You can send our kids to war while watching your investments soar but don't say uterus. Taking bribes used to be thought of as awful. Now fat cats pay for your campaigns. That's lawful. You can take our rights away and torture folks. That's still okay. Just don't say that word. <laughs> and <it> was, <laughs> so they, they were filmed, and they got a lot of, a lot of notoriety out of, out of that. So hooray for the raging <laughs> dog. And to end, to, this is just a bizarre week in uh, this day in history. It's wonderful. I love bizarre. So February the 18th was Independence Day in Gambia. Um, and there, in Mexico, there was this wonderful man, and I'm going to have to take a deep breath to say his name. It was Pedro Jose Domingo de la Cal Calazda Manuel Maria Las Corain Paredes. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Um, he was a Mexican politician who served as the 34th president of Mexico for less than one hour on February the 19th, 1913, and that was the shortest presidency in the history of the world. And no, he wasn't shot. This is a wonderful story, and n n no one lost their lives in the in the uh, in the in the event. Did he get a pension? Yeah. <laughs> Would have been nice if he had. Here's the story. On the 19th of February, General Victorino Huerta overthrew the president and ousted the vice president and attorney general, all who had been in power. So under the Mexican Constitution, after the attorney general, the foreign minister, and then the interior minister stood next in line to the presidency. So Las Corain was the foreign minister. So Huerta had Las Corain assume the presidency presidency, appoint Huerta as his interior ministry minister, making him next in line for the presidency. This is like chess pieces on, on, on the board. So it was Las Corain's job to appoint Huerta as the interior minister, and then Las Corain was supposed to resign. So he did that. So Las Corain was president for less than an hour while all of this took place. And sources quote him from about 15 to 56, six minutes, somewhere through there. So at this point, that was the shortest in history. And for those who are curious about how it all ended, 
Huerta resigned and was exiled. He was the one that was that was actual president. He resigned and was exiled within a year. So this guy fled to the U.S. where he contacted German operatives to offer his service in waging war against the U.S. <laughs> Hey, what a character. So he was subsequently arrested and died in prison, either of cirrhosis of the liver or poisoning. Nobody is quite sure. So it's all a great movie plot. Somebody should make it, other than the horror movies that you had to <laughs> sit through. And it's all true. So that, dear listeners, brings to a close another passing parade of interesting, mundane, unusual, and occasionally bizarre, and this time it was almost all bizarre events and people that make up this day in history. Thank you, Nancy, and we'll be right back. Oh, no, I've, uh, I've got an announcement, but oh, you, sure. can, you want to be right back and I can do yeah, the Yeah, you can do the announcement after. We'll be right back. Okay. What is secular humanism? Critical thinking. Knowledge is freedom. Freedom from ignorance and its offspring, fear. The BC Humanist Association has been active in the Vancouver area for over 25 years. We offer a friendly and welcoming place to make new friends, as well as free educational lectures. We invite you to join us any Sunday at 10 a.m. in the Oak Ridge Senior Center. Please visit our website for more details, bchumanist.ca. You're listening to Left at the Valley on CIVL 101.7 FM. The main source of hatred in the world is religion and organized religion. I just love how this music is coming out, you know. You get some artists are actually starting to speak out against religion and stuff like that. Nancy, you had an announcement before I yeah, abruptly cut I, you off there. No, no, no. I, 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 I abruptly... I'm a dictator <laughs> behind the board here. No, no. I abruptly overwhelmed you with my chatter, so we're, <laughs> we're even. Um, this is really interesting in that SFU is sponsoring an evening with Edward Snowden, um, who you know was the one that talked about the data breaches uh, in the CIA and then went to Russia, and he's still having problems with... with the USA, but Edward Snowden, um, sponsored by by SFU, uh, April the fifteenth at Queen Elizabeth downtown. It's very affordable: twenty dollars for adults, ten dollars for uh, students, college students, um, and anybody that that wants to go, you can go to the SFU website and uh, and get tickets through through them. So that ought to be a fascinating fascinating evening for anybody that's kept up with uh, with what's going on with him okay thank you for the announcement did you guys hear about uh richard dawkins had a stroke yes yes yeah so uh of course we wish him well and uh he apparently he's recuperating and he even made a comment to, to the point of uh, said if you want to have a stroke this is the kind you want to have well you know i'm not sure i want to have a stroke anyway <laughs> in the way shape or form <laughs> I was uh, talking to Bill. Uh, Bill, uh, I'm going to massacre his name, of course, again. Uh, Lidgerwood, uh, who actually is the uh, coordinator of uh, Imaginal Religion, which is right around the corner. So I have a little bit of an interview with Bill, so I'm going to go ahead and play that, and we'll be right back after that. Okay, I'm with Bill Litgerwood, and he's the head coordinator of the uh, Imaginal Religion Foundation. Bill, welcome to the Valley. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Glad to- See that? They just love you down here, Bill. <laughs> that's great that's great to hear <laughs> bill you you were uh heading uh the uh mega event imaginal religion six happening around uh, the end of may this year is that not true yes it's actually the long weekend in may um last year we moved it because of uh, uh the availability of richard dawkins this year we're back to normal which is the long weekend in May, and yes, it's our sixth uh, sixth go at it. You know, I, I've I've been to two of them so far, and I've I've been I've been having a blast of those. And the one thing that comes out constantly from all the guests, and you've had some fabulous guests. Uh, and I think Arn Ross at the best uh, of all the uh, convention he's been to. This is one of the best by far. It's well organized. People are super friendly, and you know what? Kudos to you for doing that. Well, thank you, Kevin. It, it's um, that's something we've prided ourselves on is uh, the fact that we haven't had um, um, a lot of hassles with this event. It's we did this because um, it was a labor of love right from the start, and we and we did this because we wanted to give people 
a sense of the feeling that we had after the first conference that we went to. Mm-hmm. This was in uh, in Burbank in uh, 2009, and um, you know we just left there feeling so energized and so um, I don't know what the word is, but that's that's the thing we've tried to duplicate, and I think we've been fairly successful successful at doing that. It's um, it's more like a retreat. It's almost like a retreat. It's it's not really a you know a, a convention anymore. It's a retreat. It's where you can come and spend the weekend with people of like mind and walk away supercharged and and just feeling great about yourself and how you feel and the fact that there's lots of other people out there that feel the same way that you do. Yeah, that's a, that's a very apt description. It's a you're amongst friends at that convention, and uh, you know, hats off to you because I'm sure it's it's not easy to organize all that. Well, it's it's um, like I said, it's always been a it's it's always been a labor of love. So it's not that it's you know we've gotten ourselves a reputation now with our speak with the speakers, for example. And once you know you get a reputation with all the people that are sort of on the speaking circuit, um, that doesn't hurt. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so what do you got in store for us this year? Who have we got? Yeah. Oh, geez, you're going to ask me tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a great lineup, um, I think. It's not quite as spectacular as last year, but I think it's pretty darn close. Let me just um, get up on here so I can see what it is, because I always forget somebody, and I don't want to forget anyone. <laughs> um, okay, well, our keynote speaker is AC Grayling. Now, we've been trying to get uh, Anthony Grayling for, well, since we started, actually, since I and R2, we've been trying to get him, and We've had a couple of uh, false alarms with him. He said yes, and then he hasn't been able to make it. So luckily and thankfully this year he has been able to make it. So we're really excited about having AC Grayling as our keynote speaker. He's uh, extremely well-known, I think, in the movement. Um, he's he's the master of the new College of the, Humani- of the Humanities in Oxford, um, a professor of philosophy at Burbank College in London, and uh, he's got over 30 books on philosophy and other subjects. So I think if anyone, um, and apparently he's an awesome speaker, so, you know, and it's going to be worth it just to see him, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also got Julia Sweeney. Now, Julia Sweeney is best known for her four seasons on Saturday Night Live, and she's also best known in our movement for... Um, Letting Go of God, which is a thing she did uh, several years ago, and her conversion basically to atheism thanks to a visit from some Mormon, <laughs> from some Mormons, which was quite entertaining and extremely funny. And um, we finally got Julia to agree to come as well, which is awesome. Uh, Dr. Michael Shermer um, is one of our speakers. He's the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, of course. Ooh, good one. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to hearing from him. Um, I think he's a really good, really good catch as well. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, we've had um, a lot of speakers, and the word just gets out. And eventually, you email these people and you say, "Would you like to come and speak at INR?" And they're just, "Yes, uh, we want to come and speak at INR because we've heard nothing but good things about it." And that's really a, not only a testament. To us, I think it's a testament to the people that come. It's, it's a like I said, it's a family event. It's a it's a retreat. It's not, you know, there's not a lot of uh, bullshit that goes on. Let me put it that way. It's it's a bunch of people that you can relate to that you're going to have a good time with, and you're going to be you're going to feel so good when you're done. Now, we all the the other um, speakers, we have Kelly Carlin. He's the daughter. She, not he, is the daughter of George Carlin. Mm. Um, so yeah, we managed to get a hold of Kelly and I had a really interesting conversation with her. I think people are really going to be interested to hear from her about, uh, just her life with George and her life in general. And I'm sure she's got stories. Hey, I'm sure she's got stories. Oh, I would think so. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Um, Joe Nickel, he's a senior research fellow of the committee for skeptical inquiry. Now he has, I don't know, I don't know, 600 books or something, not that many, but he's got a lot of books. He is he's one of the the major investigative columnists for Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Um, he was a former professional stage magician and a private investigator for a world famous agency and and he debunked the Shroud of Turin. Um, he's been involved in the uh, 
uh, the whole alien thing at, at Area 51. Um, this guy is going to be really interesting uh, to hear from, for sure. Uh, Elizabeth Loftus. Elizabeth Loftus is a person that we saw when we went to one of our first conferences, I think TAM, the first TAM conference that we went to. Um, she holds positions in departments of psychology and social behavior. Uh, she's also a professor of law in California. She did a really amazing talk about the, uh, basically about how, how uh, what's the word, how false, how, how false memory syndrome, how you can't really put much credence in eyewitness testimony. Mm, yes. And she talked specifically about the case of this, uh, this uh, daycare in the United States. Uh, where the people were all um, charged with child abuse. I don't know if you remember this. It was one family. Yeah, it rings a bell. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And she basically wrote a book on that. She went through that whole thing and um, talked about how just what the questions that the, the, the kids were being asked by all the social workers and the cops um, led to their answers. I mean, it's a really, she's really good, so she's going to be interesting. Okay. Uh, Brian Dalton, of course, Mr. Deity, Mr. we all know who he is. Yes. He's going to be along. Another person you may not have heard of is Gavin Schmidt. Gavin is someone that was suggested to us by Carolyn Porco, who was our keynote uh, last year. She was fantastic. Oh, yeah, she's she was awesome. And um, so she suggested this gentleman. He's the climate scientist and director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. So he studies climate changes in the past, present, and future using a combination of simulations, remote sensing, and historical observation observations. He's also got a couple of books. This guy is going to put to rest any doubts you may have about climate change. Not that most of us do have any doubts about that, but... Um, this is a guy that's in the know about that, and, and uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from him. Mm. Um, Margaret Downey, well, she's been to INR before. Uh, she's kind of a mainstay in the uh, humanist, atheist movement in the United States, uh, born in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge Louisiana. Um, she's became concerned about persecution from an early age and has devoted her life to any, any and all discrimination. She's founded the Free Thought Society and Anti-Discrimination anti Support Network in the United States. Uh, she's always great. Uh, Canadians, while well, we have Ali A. Rizvi, he's a Pakistani-Canadian writer, physician, and musician who resides in Toronto. He grew up in Libya and is part of a progressive Muslim, and was part of a progressive Muslim family before moving permanently to Canada in his 20s. He's an avid and vocal advocate advocate for secularism, science, and reform, particularly in the Muslim community. So mm -hmm. we're excited about having him. Um, we have Christopher DiCarlo again. Christopher is a really good friend of ours, and he's kind of helped us out throughout the years on all six of them, and he's just sort of a mainstay. We we invite him every year. I call uh, him the bravest man in Good friends of ours, and he's currently involved in a, uh, in a project in Ontario, which is now – being exported, I believe he's in Guatemala at the moment, um, talking about, it's a course on critical thinking that he's devised. So that should be really interesting. And uh, I think that's it for speakers, although we have we also have uh, James Randi. The amazing uh, Randi. Yeah, James Randi is uh, not particularly going to be a speaker per se. We have a special surprise for James when he comes. Um, he's going to be bringing his movie as well, and there may be actually a couple of people that he knows that you know that are going to show up and sort of celebrate this appearance with him. So um, he's going to be given an award. Uh, I can't really tell you much more than that, but um, let's just say that a couple of friends of his from Las Vegas will be there. Wow. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. That sounds like an all-star lineup you got uh, for us. It's pretty good. And then for entertainment, we have Stand Up for Mental Health, which is uh, a group you probably are aware of out of Vancouver. Um, they're stand-up comedians that are all involved with uh, mental health issues, and they're going to be doing. They're going to be providing the comedy. <laughs> so, Excellent. Yeah. So, so, so remind us the dates. It's in May. Yes, it's May 20th to 22nd, which okay. is the long weekend in May. Mm -hmm. um, it starts on the Friday night, goes Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It'll probably end Sunday afternoon sometime. And the cost includes uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner on Saturday, breakfast and lunch on Sunday, 
and all the uh, all the sessions. Beautiful. So if we can. If somebody wants to buy tickets. There's still some tickets available, but they're going fast. And it's at inr.ca, right? I imagine no religion.ca. Yes, the tickets are about half sold out at this point. Last year we were sold out by March. Oh. Uh, so, but we had we had uh, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I think that had a lot to do with it. Still, and, t- um, tickets are going fast. Yeah, so I don't think we'll be sold out by March, but um, it probably will sell out because we do limit it, and we limit it for the very simple reason that we want you when you come to be able to interact with the speakers and see them and talk to them and and make it a more intimate atmosphere. So that's what we strive for. That's what we've always been able to accomplish, and I think that's. <laughs> That's kind of our claim to fame. If you come to Imagine No Religion, you're probably going to have a really good chance of meeting all these people. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bill. And we'll see you at Imagine No Religion. Looking forward to seeing you again, sir. Okay, Kevin. Thank you, man. Take care. Have a good one. Okay. Good night. All right. And that was Bill. So we had a great time with that. Uh, great uh, guest list this year yet again. If you have not been to Imagine No Religion, I highly, highly recommend it. Even people that uh, go in at Imaginal Religion, uh, even the guests, I uh, usually say, like, and this is like from people like Arn Ra, they usually say, uh, this is one of the best organized conventions they've ever been to. So, uh, and it's right here in our backyard. So, might as well take advantage of it. My friend, I believe you have a report for us. I do. You're all set? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm smiling. <laughs> okay, another edition of the Reformation Report, Sunday, February 21st, 2016. Let's just jump right in. Oh, dance, Sarah, dance. Awesome. What does Chilliwack or the Fraser Valley need more than another Tim Hortons location? Oh, That's geez. right, we need another Christian school. <laughs> yeah, another one. Cascade Christian School in Chilliwack are looking to buy the five acres of land and buildings on the former UFV site on Yale Road in Chilliwack. Now, it's unfair to say another Christian school because in reality, Cascade has been operating in the area of creating bigoted children and religious brainwashing since approximately 2010. But mm, does Chilliwack really need another religious school? I mean, wouldn't Wouldn't that site be better used for social housing or for services for those who are on low income? Or what about a homeless shelter? I mean, these are novel ideas, radical, but nope. Nope, we would rather sell to an organization that is going to skip on taxes, sap money from the community, while producing bigoted children who will continue to protest a woman's right to make a choice about her own body and bully those within the LGBT community. Jeez, why don't you tell us how you really feel? Well, I'm not allowed to on air. (laughs) CRC restrictions. <laughs> now here's a story I like, and it has a church involved. So this is I'm departing a little bit from my reformed ideals. There is a new way for the youth in Chilliwack to get down. Super Sweet Sounds is a monthly community dance party for youth aged nine to fourteen. Presented in partnership with Mint Entertainment and Sticky's Candy Downtown. And believe me, if you haven't visited Sticky's Candy, ooh, Sarah's looking excited. Sticky's Candy's so <laughs> good. Anyway. Um, hey, we've got to charge it for a commercial here. <laughs> this uh, brand new event will run one Friday per month until May 20th, kicking off uh, February 19th, so they just had their first one. The Vineyard Center, which is a local downtown church, will be transformed into a dance club with lights, lasers, and the best tunes in the Fraser Valley, all with the help to feed hungry children. So uh, Super Sweet Sounds supports Chilliwack Community Services, their Starfish Backpack Program, uh, apparently, it's estimated that 600 children in Chilliwack go to school hungry on Monday mornings. And so while they are provided with breakfast, lunch, and recess snacks at the school, they don't have access to nutrition, to nutritionist food, nutritional food over the weekends. So the Absurd Rotary Club created the Starfish Backpack Program in 2014 to address the same need within their, social, uh, within their school district. And the program has grown into, uh, into five other cities. The program is simple. Backpacks full of food are sent home with each child on Fridays to feed the child and their family over the weekend. The cost of filling each backpack is $525 per school year. Not bad. And 100% of the donations received go directly to purchasing food. So 
In Chilliwack, since, 2000, since September of 2015, the program has been implemented in three schools, now serving 80 children. And the goal is to expand the program to ensure that no child in Chilliwack can go hungry or goes hungry over the weekend. I think it's a fantastic program. And you know what? Sounds great. Kudos to the, the Vineyard Church for opening up their uh, their doors to allow that to happen. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, unfortunately, I'm going to go back to my negative and pessimistic views. Um, <laughs> Abbotsford. Kinder, Kinder Morgan Canada says that it has signed a community benefit agreement with the city of Abbotsford. It's the first community along the pipeline route to sign such a deal. Chilliwack threw the deal out last year. For giving its support to Kinder Morgan, Abbotsford will get $1.3 million towards revitalizing the Ledgewood Golf Course. That's oh, right. Where the money is needed. Yes. I mean, hey, again, we could put $1.3 million towards social housing, social programs, but no, we would rather improve the area for the rich and the not-so-famous to swing their little clubs and hit little balls. and make, Lifestyles of the oh, rich and famous. I'm just going to throw that one away. <laughs> Fraser Health. On more happy news, Fraser Health is going to close hospital beds at the Abbotsford Regional Hospital and other facilities, including Mission this spring, as it continues to struggle to overcome long-standing concerns about emergency room congestion and the length of patient stays. Fraser Health is closing a total of 80 inpatient beds at 10 to 12 of its hospitals and aims at shifting aging patients out of hospitals and back into the local community. Now problem with this there's obviously more to this story than what i have gathered but i do remember a time when one of the health regions in the area closed uh some of the wings and wards on riverview with the idea of distributing those who are suffering with mental illness back into the community so now here we have another stellar idea of putting our aged population back into the community and i can guarantee you they will have as little support as those with mental illness did so you know what the medical community calls seniors? What's that? Bed blockers. Oh, really? Really. They call them bed blockers because they take up too much room and they really need more convalescent care than mm. acute care. And so they try to get the seniors out of there. At least they did. They try to get the seniors out of there as fast as possible, which leads to, to more critical problems for the seniors, of course. And, and, and they, they do. I mean, like, I, I work in a, in a residential care facility for seniors. And, yeah, I mean, if, if a senior goes into hospital, I guarantee you within, like, 24, 48 hours, the hospital are calling saying, okay, hey, got to come pick him up or come pick her up because we don't have any room for this person when they, you know, when the care facilities don't have the necessary medical staff to, to do it. So, yeah, I think that's a topic for a show, actually, is the seniors. And, Nancy, this one's for you. This is for you, Nancy. <laughs> Did you know... That under the Abbotsford bylaw, which has been in place since 1997, now I don't want, can you give her a tissue? I don't want her crying. Stripping or exotic dancing is prohibited in any venue with a liquor license. Breaking it carries a minimum fine of $1,000. So, Nancy, you can't go and have a drink and watch the Bono Boys mm, doing their thing. No, but, but, but wait a minute, but can I have a beer and strip at the same time? <laughs> in the privacy of your own home, I'm sure that would be allowed. But I, if you I are a li- that sounds like a loophole. Does well, it say anything about it, the exotic dancer drinking at the time that she's stripping? Well, because or, I've been doing it for a while, and, I, <laughs> and no one has bothered me. The comments so of I, Nancy I, I are not like those of Left of the, of the Valley. I'm, it's associate and uh, yeah. <laughs> A sold-out male strip show. Oh, now Sarah's <laughs> crying. A, a sold-out male strip show styled after the Hollywood blockbuster Magic Mike was cancelled in the Fraser Valley, leaving downtown customers cursing the bylaws. Canadian Playboys, mm, a male entertainment company, was forced to axe a planned to, a planned April 23rd show at the Station Pub in Abbotsford. Such an exotic location, that is. Um, over a city ban that bans exotic dancing in bars. Uh... The owner, Brad Alexander, said, We're sorry about this, but we really can't do anything about it when they have these laws in place. Even though they're outdated, we still have to follow them. The event was planned as part of a Magic Mike's Lady Night tour, and the organizer said there will be shows in Langley and Aldergrove. Uh, Mr. Alexander said that they're looking at finding a replacement venue for April 23rd, but not in Abbotsford, obviously, he said. But, but could I be a raging granny exotic dancer and fill in, <laughs> do you think? Um, well, Again, I, you know what? the After comments th- of Nancy are not necessarily those of Let the Valley, it's crew oh, and oh, subsidiaries. Sarah's jumping in. We've got a new career. We've got a fight to do. 
Uh, you and I are going to open a business together. Oh, <laughs> this is what happens when the studio is packed full. <laughs> oh, we're going to make the bylaws committee so busy. <laughs> exactly. So, comments on Facebook. Thanks to Abbotsford for reminding us all how dull and boring this city really is. Another comment said, maybe we should ban bathing suits because it shows too much skin and some Abbotsford uh, residents might be offended. I look good in a two-piece. In North Bay, Ontario, in North Bay, Ontario, they don't allow males or females to show nipples. So we have to put tape or something over the nipples, according to Mr. Alexander when these guys dance. In other areas where only the act of stripping is illegal, his group can sometimes get by dancing without really removing any clothes. Uh, it happens from time to time in different areas of the country, so it is what it is. And on that skimpy note, that is all for now for me, the Reformed. Stay critical, stay sane, stay put. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, the Reformed. <laughs> I don't care anymore. <laughs> My identity is busted. Oh. All right. Well, I got a great little story for you guys. It is. Things that make you go. All right. Now, did you know? That apparently, capitalism will end us by 2050. Capitalism has generated massive wealth for some, but its devastated planet has failed to improve human and well, uh, well-being at scale. Species are going extinct at a rate of 1,000 times faster than that of natural rate over the previous 65 million years. And that's for the uh, Center for Health and the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School. Since 2000, 6 million hectares of primary forests have been lost each year. That's essentially... 14,826,322 acres are just less than the entire state of West Virginia. That was by the 2010 assessment by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN. Even in the US, 15% of the population lives below the poverty line. For children under 18, that number increases to 20%. The world's population is expected to reach 10 billion by 2050. Professor Christopher Wright and Daniel Nyberg published Climate Change, Capitalism, and Corporations uh, last fall, arguing that businesses are locked in a cycle of exploiting our world's resources in even more creative ways. Our book shows how large corporations are able to continue engaging increasingly environmentally exploitative behavior by obscuring the link between endless economic growth and worsening environmental destruction, they wrote. Yale sociologist Justin Farrell studied 20 years of corporate funding and found that Corporations have used their wealth to amplify contrarian views for climate change and they create an impression of greater scientific uncertainty than actually exists. You guys have any thoughts about that? Yes, but it takes too long. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree with you. It takes too long. I have to think of it first. No, yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, um, for some reason it's easier for us to think of the end of the world in apocalyptic terms than it is to think of us of the end of capitalism. And that's an interesting uh, question we should ask ourselves. Why is that? Right? Um, it seems to me that our, 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 our model for, for the economic model we have is based on continual growth. But, you know, we have finite resources. So at some point, something's going to have to give. So, any interesting comment on this? Yes, no? This is a great radio, guys. Wonderful. <laughs> six of us here and here, and we can't come up with one thought between the six of us. <laughs> well, anyway, that's food for thought. Um, okay. Continuing on. Today, we're doing a show on health supplements. And our wonderful Martina has done a crap load of research. And she's going to enlighten us. Mike is all yours, dear. Indeed she does. Um, well, actually, I came here heavy-handed and well-equipped. Not so much with lots of research, but with a very, very heavy toolkit to, uh, well, enlighten everybody on this particular kind of subject. So first of all, about me, why, why on earth would I bother to look into uh, health supplements? Well, first of all, um, I worked in that industry, not just because I needed the money, I was desperate and young and, you know, all that story, but... Um, <laughs> that sounds like somebody who's had a stripper <laughs> job. I was desperate and young and worked in the health industry. <laughs> I, it comes pretty 
close. So no, but um, <laughs> no, because I actually I I drank the Kool Aid by the gallon. So if I I'm, I'm starting to point fingers like, have you ever taken a health supplement in your life? So it's it's not. I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm not judging. Why are you looking at me while saying that? Although I I do yeah, still take health up on myself. So. so yeah, why, it's why gonna is be, that? That's scary to rumble, you and me. <laughs> yeah, so we have to look into that. Why on earth are you doing that? So what I actually brought with me is um, my favorite tool that works for a lot of things that any skeptic is investigating at some point in time. It is a few pages out of uh, Carl Sagan's... Um, uh, the Demon Haunted World. It's Chapter 12, The mm. Fine Art of Baloney Detection. Yes, the baloney detecting kit. It is awesome. So, yeah. Um, well, my background, so, yes, I did sell that stuff. And at some point, um, I asked myself those questions like, does this really work? Why do I believe some of these products work and some don't? And um, so... I started asking these questions and of course I couldn't talk to anybody involved in, in this area because then you're pretty much out of a job right away. <laughs> so um, now you have to, 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 to not just drink the Kool-Aid, you have to share it. Um, yeah, so I started reading interesting books. So for instance, um, a very good one in this particular subject is uh, Bad Signs from Ben Goldacre. Um, then it was still very confusing for me why one yeah one thing seems to seem to work for me I accept that but others were like completely baloney like uh, let's say homeopathy oh um, geez yeah that's an entire show right there <laughs> so my go-to person for these kinds of que questions was actually a neurologist and a skeptic by the name of Steve Novella and he has some really good um, uh, shows, so you could say um, uh, he's, he's teaching on that subject, and these um, courses the, he, that he's teaching are called Your Deceptive Mind, so that's about how your brain works and a actually misleads you, and the other one that was really interesting and really nailed it was Medical Myths, Lies, and Half-Truths. So based on this, and this wonderful um, baloney detection kit and the fact that at least another person in this room has taken or is taking supplements <laughs> he says with a smirk <laughs> <laughs> okay so let me just quote a few things from Carl Sagan when he is actually um, looking at we just mentioned that actually here commercial culture and how, s how things are promoted in the outside world um, he says in a quote, You're not supposed to ask. Don't think. Buy. Paid product endorsement, especially by real or purported experts, constitute a steady rainfall of deception. They betray contempt of the intelligence of their customers. They introduce an insidious corruption of popular attitudes about scientific objectivity. So you don't happen to have a bottle with you because what I would like to well, do... We're in the middle of Studio CIVL. No, I don't have my supplements here with me. What? <laughs> what? People don't actually carry those around with them all the time? Yes. No, apparently not. No, no, we're talking here about natural... Well, natural. Okay. Um, <laughs> health food supplements, essentially. Yes. We're not talking about homeopathy. Nope. We're just talking about vitamins. Exactly. Right. Okay. And you are saying, essentially, it's bupkis. All of it. Not all of it. Okay. I wouldn't say all of it because here's the thing. I'm not an expert. You're not an expert. Yeah. Well, not the nice thing, <laughs> The nice thing about being a skeptic is actually or what I, I have found out is not having all the answers but asking the right questions. So okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. So um, so when you look at your bottle, what's actually on there? What does it tell you? What's, what's in there? What does it do for your body? What does it claim? Okay, f <laughs> fair enough. Uh, I think in most bottles are very, um, they don't say a whole lot. For If you have a bottle of magnesium, it'll say it has magnesium content. It'll say, you know, uh, maybe consult the doctor, but it won't actually say what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. That's what I've noticed on most products. Exactly. So how do people get to buy them? And, of course, there are good reasons. 
let's say you go to your doctor and uh, the doctor says, well, you do have a um, insufficient amount of whatever in your blood. Please take a supplement. Yes. In this case, I probably won't argue because, well, he probably has read one or two books about medicine. He should know his thing. Um, but everything outside that, apart from that, why on earth would you take it if you're not sure you actually have a deficiency? Well, I, I think for, for myself, I can only speak for myself, uh, the supplements I take is because I know that the, the, the majority of the food we eat is deficient in some nutrients. Um, magnesium and calcium, for example, are two very good examples. Um, my mother, for example, and, uh, has a restless leg syndrome. Uh, and I have part of it too. And I know that if I don't take calcium for quite a while, calcium, calcium, magnesium for a while, you get that restless leg syndrome, especially uh, close at night, right? It feels like you need to go out there and jog 20 miles. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, apparently that's, that's, that's a neuro neurological thing, but apparently it's, it's, I wouldn't say cured, but maybe ab abated by uh, the, the proper taking of uh, calcium and uh, magnesium. So that's why I take that supplement. Um, now, do I have a doctor that's actually following me and telling me this? And no, I don't. I, I to be quite honest. And is it a placebo effect? Maybe it is. Mm -hmm. But so you you think you think I, I shouldn't need to take this? Mm, here's the thing. It is actually um, one of the things in this beautiful detection kit. Is this something that you could test independently? <sighs> independently? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Well, here's a beautiful example about how you would have to separate var variables in your testing. So suppose, he says, Carl Sagan, uh, suppose you're seasick and given both an acupressure bracelet and 50 milligrams of meclizine. You find the unpleasantness vanishes. What did it? The bracelet or the pill? You can tell only if you take the one without the other next time you're seasick. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that you're not so dedicated to science as to be willing to be seasick. Then you won't separate the variables. You'll take both remedies again. You have, you have achieved the desired practical result. Further knowledge, you might say, is not worth the discomfort of attaining it. Oh, and that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm, okay. So... At this point, I don't think I could separate magnesium. Well, I'm told that if you take magnesium, calcium helps to absorb it. Or is it the other way around? I forget. I forget now. So, so I, I, don't, I don't have a way of taking of, of testing. Either just take magnesium or, or just take calcium, right? And I know that. Sorry. Don't finish your sentence. Yeah, <laughs> and I, like I said, and, and we know that. Uh, Stats point that uh, a lot of our food is less nutritious now than it used to be, and most of us are deficient in some of these uh, nutrients. So I'm not saying I'm not saying go overboard and just pack a lot of things, but uh, there are a few things that apparently are good to take. You know, zinc supplements apparently are not a bad thing because apparently we're deficient in zinc, magnesium, calcium, and maybe some vitamin D, uh, and that's usually what I take. Have you found that if you don't take vitamin C, that your restless leg syndrome um, vitamin is exasperated? Does it come back? Is it is it more prevalent? Um, well, I, I I have this little bottle of uh, calcium magnesium uh, thing in the fridge, and uh, I I kind of take a bit of a teaspoon of it every night or so. But if I don't take it like for two three days because I forget and because I'm just busy like everybody else, it seems to come back. If you ate two oranges rather than took the supplement, would there be a significant change? Well, that's already part of my diet. I already have plenty of vitamin C in, in, in oranges like that. So uh, so you, if you take the natural food, the oranges, and you don't take the supplement, mm -hmm. then the restless leg syndrome is still there. That's a good question. Which I, means that maybe if you increase the number of orange, I'm just I'm just wondering whether or not yeah. this is something that you could that people not you independently, but I'm just wondering whether if people increased the their intake of the natural food rather than took the supplement, whether or not that would be a, a positive or negative result. Yeah, but I mean, as, how many oranges can you eat in one day, right? I mean, there's also, you know, the acidity know. of the orange affects me too, I, I, well, right? Well, I guess point. it would depend on how many oranges or how much vitamin C it, would, it takes to deal with your restless leg syndrome. I mean, it may be well, I don't, more, I don't think it's vitamin more for C I you need. than I, for me. I don't, I don't know how you determine those things, but it's, it seems it's to be interesting to ask the questions and, you know, and, and go from there. It seems to be magnesium that helps with that. Magnesium. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, same same thing with my mother. She she's taken much more. She's been suffering from restless legs ever mm-hmm. since she was sixteen, and you know, she still you know for 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 many nights will spend the night just walking around, not sleeping because of it. So for her, it's affecting her way way more. Uh, and uh, when I've put her on some strong magnesium supplements, it's not taking it away, but it's diminishing it. Right. So it's, it seems to be on the right track. Right. And you know, I know it's not scientific, and I know we're used to that. And I know it could be considered anecdotal evidence, but it seems to be working on that sense. And as we just pointed out, uh, you're n- not really willing to to sacrifice this little bit of comfort that you actually have um, in order to obtain more knowledge, because right now it feels good. So if it works good and works for you, why why tweak it? Yeah, yeah. When it's not, why fix it when it's not broken, right? Yeah. Are you challenging Kevin to an experiment? <laughs> well, it almost sounds, sounds like it, isn't it? It sounds like a throwdown yeah, to me. It's like, okay, Kevin, let's see, let's see what you can do. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, actually. What my curiosity is, sorry, jumping in no, here, please Marcia, go ahead. Is um, my curiosity is because you take the supplement, or say, okay, not, I don't want to pick on Kevin, but I do. Oh, just pick on Kevin, Dan. Okay, good. No, no, no. Um, said, so because you, <laughs> you you take the supplement, right, and then you miss taking it for a while, is your restless leg syndrome simply a natural withdrawal symptom? of not having the extra and would there I'm curious if over time your body would naturally start to produce or uh, absorb the calcium from other sources and then you wouldn't need the supplement the only reason why you get the restless leg syndrome if you notice it is because your body's actually withdrawing from the over abundance of calcium that's just my thought because like, it's like it's like any vitamins or vitamins or however you call them um they are a they're a, it is a drug right so really well, I don't know if I would label Natu- them as natural. They are drugs. And they're naturally occurring yeah. substances. Yeah, they do yeah. interact with some medications too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's so true. anyway, I just just thought I'd put that in there. What kind of experiment would we devise to see if if it's the magnesium or or lack of magnesium in my food that does it right? I mean, we'd have to research what kind of food produces a lot of magnesium and how much magnesium I would need. And actually what your absorption rate is, if you're actually absorbing it. How would I test that as the average person, right? How do you, how do you test that? Well, first of all, you would have to figure out with, I think, a blood test if you're actually deficient. Or if there is an underlying neurological disorder at play. Oh, well. So so I would, I would have... <laughs> <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Sorry. Uh, he said the <laughs> mental issues. And the well, that's true. You get into self-medicating, and as long as you don't have any side effects, you think it, and, and, it's okay. And the, and the original mm-hmm. symptoms are going away. You think you're doing a good thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, like you, Martine, I think that the best thing to do, or one of the, the things to do, is to do a, a lot of research in into the topic. And you know, Google Google becomes your best friend in, in many instances to to see you know what actually is is occurring, and if you are taking too much, you know, the, the the side effects that could eventually, you know, come back and bite you in the fanny, in, so to speak. Yeah, the best case scenario of, uh, well, taking too much of a good thing is that you produce very expensive pee. Yeah. That's the best thing that can happen. <laughs> well, you're urinating uh, radioactive waste there. It's <laughs> glowing in the dark. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's, that's one point uh, as well. As I said, I'm not here to answer all your questions. I'm, I'm asking the questions. <laughs> I don't have all well, the answers. That's true. There, there are there, there are people in the in the medical and a- allied medical fields that um, make quite a nice income from supplements. And when you hear yes. that they're good for you from someone who is supposed to be you know an expert in the medical field, you tend to have a lot of validity so and you might take them and not realizing that you're taking the vitamins is helping him pay for his yacht and you bring me right back to the baloney detection kit because one point here is argument from authority just because somebody recommends it and might even be an authority in the field a doctor does not mean it's valid well, hold on here. We've got to be careful with that, right? Because I, I can understand the argument from authority, mm-hmm. but let's not confuse the argument from authority with the argument from expert, right? Mm-hmm. If it's somebody in the field, if, if it's a doctor that, that, that Different. recommends... Yeah, exactly, Different. right? So let, let, let's, let's be very clear about this. Yeah, because, well, usually you get your supplements not from a doctor. Oh, yeah, that's... Okay, fair enough. And uh, so when you go out and talk to the person who's recommending the supplements, it's usually... 
a salesperson. Okay, but so, de- devil's advocate here for half a second. Yes, like. please. Uh, um, <laughs> most doctors are not uh, trained in nutrition either, right? Are you sure about that? Well, I mean, their feel, their feel is they might be trained in some pharmacology, and yeah, they have to be okay. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, uh, in nutrition, you know, you usually go see a nutritionist, right? You don't see it. You don't see your GP. And in this case, I wouldn't even say you're not seeing your nutritionist because nutritionist is actually not a uh, the proper description, the proper term. Everybody can do a few nutrition classes and call themselves a nutritionist. You would go to a dietitian. Oh, my Aunt Susie's rolling in her grave now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to say um, I, I go to my doctor, and um, as part of that, I'm actually he actually has a nutritionist, a uh, dietitian, excuse me. Okay. Come in every six weeks, and I can't see that person. So apparently, there is a way to to um, get that expertise if, uh, if mm-hmm. you want it. Yeah, but okay, okay. Let's uh, let's be, let's be honest here. And uh, the average Please. guy, like myself, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I ha- I have some symptoms. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what they are. Doing a bit of research, and you know, because symptoms can be kind of vague, right? I I come to the conclusion myself that I might be having some restless leg syndrome. My mother has a hard history of that, and she's been diagnosed. Now, I myself, I've not been diagnosed. But, you know, I feel it'd be very hard for a doctor to diagnose me because it's very sporadic at best. Now, doing a bit of research with people that do sell supplements and people that have had like restless, restless leg syndrome, not, I did not go to a doctor, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to that, but they told me magnesium is what helps with this. Now, it's anecdotal, but the mm-hmm. magnesium seems, if, unless it's a placebo effect, mm-hmm. seems to be working. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is the average experience of the average person. As much as, you know, we're skeptics and we want to, you know, point to factual information, I don't see how that scenario could have gone differently for the average person. You know, I, I don't see how I could have gone to a doctor and do a blood test if I'm deficient. I go to a doctor and say, I might be deficient in magnesium because of this, this, this. I, it's unlikely. You'll probably say, you know, go home. You're wasting our time, Right. I think that whatever it is that you're doing, I think, and, and Martina's right. I think skept, being a skeptic is is your best way to go at this point because there are some vitamins that um, will will uh, can be eliminated from your body over a short period mm-hmm. of time. You take them, they do what they need to do, and they're gone. There are other vitamins and minerals that will stay in your system and over a long period of time may cause you some harm. As the average person, you don't know which is which. It's a matter of trusting a doctor that that really understands the topic and will um, not be using it as a as a financial um, supplement. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, he's he's giving you the the food supplement, and you. Well, this really is this is very complex. Long, over a long Indeed. period of time, what the side effects, and in many, in, I'm not going to say many. That's an exaggeration. In some instances, what you think is helping you in the short term is actually combining or, or doing things with your. Um, in, internal organs that are going to be damaging over a long period of time. So uh, rather than go to the drugstore and just buy a bottle, I, I think as Martina is saying, you use your your uh, baloney detector and do a lot of research so that you can feel comfortable and stay healthy. I mean, I think we can agree that some supplements, I mean, even myself, I kind of raise an eyebrow, right? For Like um, Kaleido Silver, for example. You know, and they they say if you dilute some very minute amount of silver in the water and ingest that, apparently that's good for you. I I I find that extremely hard to believe, and I think I believe there is actually also a study that shows that if you do too much of that, yeah, it would actually change the color of your skin. Yeah, it turns you into a Smurf. Yeah, it's a, a <laughs> kind of a blue grayish thing. So you you got to be careful with that stuff, and there, there is a huge market for it. There is a huge market. It is. Um, no, just. Uh yeah, as I tried to say at the beginning, I'm not condemning everything and saying everything is bogus because it's not working. Okay. Some things might be working. Some things might just be the placebo effect. Um, but what my worry is and what actually got me out of that business was the question that everybody, and Nancy went that way, she went down that road, 
everybody should ask themselves, uh, what's the harm? And even in, in a, I would say, rather, I would say, mild case, <laughs> so just taking, let's say, one or two supplements, um, the worst thing is, again, very expensive peas. So basically, you're burning your money for something that you might be able to obtain from food. For instance, just off the bat, I would say magnesium, try almonds. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, and that's fair. That's totally fair. I mean, if if you're if you're deficient in the, uh, if you could get it from a food source, you should always go for that fair that that, mm-hmm. that first, right? Uh, calcium. The people have a tendency to go for milk, but apparently sesame seeds are, have more more calcium than milk to begin with. Uh, so yeah, there is some knowledge you can certainly acquire. Um, Going back to your dietitian, yes. Yeah. Also, I, let's be honest. There's also a matter of convenience too, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, in our busy day, and you know, I'm on the road on a very regular basis. You know, uh, I can't stop to have a nice warm lunch. You know, unfortunately, it's it. So I usually have a sandwich or something like that, right? I might even stop at a Burger King. Or, <gasps> heaven forbid. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm ashamed. <laughs> so, in your research, did you find something that you know for sure is like good or not good? Um, let me put it this way. Um, because we're we've got some great info and we've given some great information, but we're still I feel still feel like we're vague here, right? Because it's a complex subject. Um, yeah. Well, what's I, I'd like to go there. What's the harm? So as I said, uh, the the least harm is your loss of money. Because hey, paying, that's a lot of harm. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's but not that bad because actually may, maybe you just cut your losses and say okay maybe I can tweak my lifestyle a little bit around and go shopping once in a while for fresh veggies and just do it that way. Mm-hmm. Possible, it's doable. It's not as convenient as just popping a pill. I know, um, but uh, there are other things as Sagan says it at the end of this chapter: gullibility kills. Um, because. I came across people in my line of work who were actually suffering from really, really vicious diseases. So they were cancer stricken. They had really, really something you need to see a specialist for. They come into your store and they tell you, well, I have this and this stage, whatever cancer, what can I, what can can you do for me? What can you suggest? And so you have your boss breathing down your neck that you actually have to sell something to this person. So, and then, of course, because this person is desperate and wants something, the doctor is at the wit's end. They just had the, I don't know, umptiest attempt of of therapy, and it didn't work. So, of course, they want something. They need something. So they have heard about this wonderful superfood juice, and it's 60 bucks a bottle, and will this help me? Yeah, okay. I, I totally get that. So, yeah, that's that's really something that's the most disgusting feeling I can imagine. And it just makes you to quit right there. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, one of our previous show, we had, um, I remember when we had Tanya come in and she had stomach cancer. And uh, we actually went over some statistics. I, I know like, like chemotherapy is not a popular subject for a mm. lot of people. And, you know, I hate chemotherapy myself, too, because, you know, it's essentially chemotherapy is will poison you and hope the cancer dies before you do. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. But it's it's still the best weapon we have against a cancer. So when I see people saying, well, I've got cancer, but I'm not going to do the chemotherapy, but I'm going to do alkaline Some water al- or something like that. Alternative. Yeah, that, that, that bothers me a lot. And it's, uh, you know, you should really try stuff that works first before going on a whim. Uh, and we have several people doing that kind of stuff. Uh Remember Bob Marley? He died mm-hmm. something similar in a similar way. Uh, he had, I believe, it was cancer in his toes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and he he decided to not go with conventional uh, what works, and he, he paid with his life. Uh, we actually have Val Kilmer that's doing something similar right now, except he's he's a Christian scientist, so he's praying. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, exactly. Who had actually a kind of pancreatic cancer that would have been treatable. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, as far as I know, he said towards the end of his life that he regretted his decision. But unfortunately, then by then it was too late. Um, it doesn't even have to be this dramatic. Um, it's just when you have a deficiency, you think, or some ailment, some disease, and you take a supplement hoping that it might help you, you're actually foregoing the treatment. You are... Really, sh- you're just throwing out your money, hoping for for an effect, 
and you're missing out going to a doctor to a specialist you're missing out on getting a referral if you're not happy with your doctor because i get that not every doctor is a great doctor and will be able to help you but you have other options than just giving out hundreds and hundreds of dollars for stuff that might or might not work or even harm you yes and of course in the extreme case we've seen people do a remember that fad they had uh, psychic surgery you guys remember that oh, yes geez. well i think i think a lot of times too you deal with people who are uh, are afraid and fear does you know fear mm -hmm. can do a lot of harm yeah, yeah you, you don't say, think about your money, i don't right? I, I don't want to go to the doctor because i'm i'm afraid i'm going to get a shot he's going to find something wrong it's going to be cancer they're going to have to take out my stomach i'm going to have to go through radiation i'm going to have to go through chemotherapy and you know people who have had those kinds of treatments and you say you know, if I could just take a pill and have a juice and I'll be okay, that sounds so much better. And so you you start down that road and you feel better because you're you're saying, oh, I've eliminated my fear. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is you're delaying, you know, not in all cases, but in, in many cases, I think supplements are fear driven. You know, take, oh, yeah. if you're afraid of getting some awful disease, you can take this. And people fail to do the research to see if that's really true. It just sounds really good. And it's people who sell supplements can make it, you know, sound as though that's the answer. That's and so you don't go any further in, in you, finding out yourself. Uh, I think that's You the, receive that's the, the training for yeah. that, actually. Yeah. So the companies actually sell you the... Uh, uh, send over their sales reps they invite you to um, dinners and uh, a little bit of education so you get a free meal and you get some guy who's telling you about the beauty of that particular product what it does so you just have to you know roll down roll with it and just repeat these stuff yeah. over and over again to your customers there are some great sales pitches that masquerade as education oh yes and people often don't know the difference and they think well but he told me and there are all of this all the statistics and all the research and and it, it's worked out so and but you you've never read the research yourself you're taking it on the advice of somebody who went to a sales pitch training and learned how to present it. And they may not have read the actual research or the research was not done properly. But You see that on a regular basis, especially when they start yeah. saying natural. Yeah. You know, they say, start saying, oh, the, the, this, this is from natural ingredients, you know, go back to nature kind of feeling. You know, mm -hmm. you know science is going to fail you. And uh, don't take those chemical compounds. But mm, let's face it, everything chemical is natural to begin with, too, Indeed. right? So, water is a chemical. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's, speaking of water, uh, there, there was one I, I thought was so incredibly hilarious at the same time. Uh, the guy was trying to sell me oxygen to put in the water. Well, I said, well, first of all, that sounds all great, fine, and dandy, but it was a liquid on top of that. So I get, hold, hold on, you got liquid oxygen that I'm putting in water. Why would I need oxygen? Why would I drink oxygen? I need oxygen to breathe, not to drink, right? So why would they need that? And oh, there's H two O. There's a you know, <laughs> okay. So if you do H two O two, that's, that's poisonous. <laughs> that's really bad, right? But it's it, it just goes to to show that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of misinformation in in that sector. Or again, I'm just, yeah, please. Go ahead. I'm just curious if anyone knows what the the actual state of the law is on on supplements. I mean, the, the last I heard in any major way, and I told you guys before, I don't know a lot about this topic. But years and year, probably more than a decade ago, I I thought they had brought in some law um, that had prevented them from making claims on the bottle. But clearly, there are other ways around that. Yes. Um, so I don't know anything, but does anybody have an answer to that? Oh yeah, uh, actually, I was working in the in that um, in the field when that actually happened. So basically, what what happened was that the um, um, suppliers would pull their their stuff from the shelf and relabel it, and actually just so they would they would file for an FDA number. So actually they would get a um, uh, process started that would evaluate not if their stuff works, but if it's harmful. Mm. So if it was deemed harmless, then all they had to do was uh, get a different label, uh, remove some of the ingredients. So actually the ingredients would, would shift places. They were in the active ingredients on the old bottle. And when you got the new bottle, they were in the fillers. 
So basically, they didn't do anything to the product. They just relabeled them and just put the sentence on there that the FDA did neither, let's say, uh, confirm or deny that this stuff is actually working. <laughs> that was basically what happened. Yeah, they can't say it's a cure. They can say no. it's a supplement, and they can say maybe you, it helps manage a certain disease or whatever. But I know they can't. That. Use, they can't use the word manage either. No. It, they used to be, you know, it was a, a, a semantic, yeah, you know, a semantics not, game. And I've forgotten all the words that you can or can't. But I know cure, cure was just yeah. that's a big X through, mm -hmm. through cure. Hmm. Yeah, so that's but, technically. But what they happens. can say it may. I think may is one of the words that they they can use. Yes. The lawyers worked out the words that you can can use. Yeah. Not the medical people. The lawyers worked out. Back yeah, to the baloney who, detection who's not, kit. Who's not going to be liable <laughs> if you take this pill? It's a weasel word. So I guess in uh, <laughs> I guess in conclusion we say, we should say there might be some good, but most likely isn't in exactly. your food health store, and you should really uh, aim to maybe improve your diet. Mm -hmm. before you go and pop a pill. Uh, pop a pill, which is, I, I agree, it is the easier way, but um, this this is why skept being a skeptic is so hard. You really have to use your brain, and you really have to think things through a bit, and yes, I know, popping a pill is much more convenient. <laughs> okay, so I guess we'll, our, our conclusion for health food stores, probably not worth visiting? Be cautious. Be skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for this. Uh, anything else you guys want to add before we close out the show? No, but that was a really good discussion. Who knew that that was going to turn into you know a discussion in real depth on uh, on food supplements? I'm glad we had it today. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so Martina. Thank you so much for all the information, and thank you guys for being here with us. Uh, coming up soon. Uh, we'll have uh, rapper uh, artist Baba Brinkman. We have an interview with him. Uh, our next show, we should be featuring uh, Aaron from uh, the Center for Inquiry. And uh, we also are working on a show called The Magic of... Uh, sorry, The Science of Magic. We're working on that. Plenty of other great things we'll have on this show. You can always reach us at leftatvalley.com. You can uh, send us an email at leftatvalley at outlook.com. I keep forgetting about saying that. And you can reach us on Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time. Such power.